All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, super glad you're here for the uh, June edition of Scrum Professionals Meetup Evening Program. And I am super excited that we've got uh, Michelle uh, Hockheiser, and if I'm not quite pronouncing that right, hopefully, hopefully Michelle will, will correct me, um, uh, with us tonight. Uh, Michelle is a certified team coach. Uh, she's been in the uh, IT industry over 20 years. She's joining us from just outside of Atlanta this evening. Uh, so she's, she's staying up a bit late to be with us. Super grateful for that. Um, and she's really been focusing the last like six plus years on uh, coaching, coaching individuals, teams, senior leaders. Um, uh, her full-time gig is an, as a, an agile transformation leader and coach for a big Fortune 500 company. And, you know, because that's not enough, uh, she also runs her own company called the Agile Skills Academy where she is accredited through the Scrum Alliance to be able to grant uh, advanced certified Scrum Master and advanced certified, or I'm sorry, certified Scrum Professional Scrum Master uh, to people via coaching. And uh, I actually did work with uh, Michelle along my journey uh, for the advanced certified Scrum Master. So kind of thrilled that Michelle is here with us. And, um, and you know, I guess it makes sense that maybe she has a lot of extra time to, you know, do all that coaching outside of her full-time job. Because, uh, you know, she only has uh, a four-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son as well. So, you know, clearly there'd be all kinds of extra time. I'm kind of in awe of uh, all the stuff that Michelle does. And then on top of that, she's hanging out with us tonight. So uh, I am super grateful for that. And uh, Michelle... It is your show. Thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you, Chris, for the um, warm intro. And Chris and Betty, thank you both for inviting me to um, this meetup group. And especially thank you to the meetup group for having me. So I appreciate it. So um, this is kind of, you know, a small group, which is great for, for coaching. So I'm going to try to do my best to stay away from the PowerPoint and just make this session as absolutely engaging as possible. I love when people interact with me. I love when people jump in, throw questions out at me and um, interrupt me. And the more engaged you are, the more engaged I am. And we're all going to have high energy um, before we leave here. However, I know that sometimes you don't really necessarily want to ask a question because it's kind of embarrassing or whatever and you don't even want me to know who you are. So if you click on the link that I just sent in the chat, uh, there is a section where you could type in questions. People could see your questions and vote on it. However, you could also call out your questions to me. So I was gonna ask, um, this first question, um, so you should see a quick little poll, and it says, what are you hoping to learn during today's meeting? And we know it's all about coaching, but is there a specific area you want me to hone in on? So I'm going to leave that open for just a, a few minutes and keep on chatting. So questions and, and uh, letting me know what you want to learn, I will make sure to cover all of those topics. And um, at the very end, I'm going to do a live coaching session with a volunteer. So as I go through this, be thinking in the back of your head, something that you would like to be coached on, something that I can coach on, but not during this allotted time frame. I always get, tell me how to change my coworker or can you help me fix my husband's behavior? I cannot coach you in the 10 to 15 minute session about changing somebody else. So um, it's gotta be you focused, something that you want to achieve, something that you have a problem with, something that you don't know how to get started on, okay? So um, I can give you some examples of some items that um, I've, I've coached on in the past. I had one individual 
say, hey, my running path closed. What what happens, right? There is no place to run. He wanted to run through a graveyard that got closed down. So it, it could be absolutely anything. Um, one person was having a problem breaking up with his girlfriend. So that was a coaching session. And then of course, which is way less fun, right? But I also do coach on professional sessions such as you're having a conflict at work. How do you handle it and go about it? Or you wanna make that next career move. So just keep those things in, in the back of your mind and we'll go from there. Does anybody have any questions for me so far? Okay, most excellent. So there's different types of coaching, right? There is agile coaching, there's life coaching, there's sports coaching, but what exactly is coaching, right? A lot of times we define coaching by what it's not, right? What have you guys heard about coaching? What has been your experiences with coaching? Does anyone want to share? Having to always explain what's a coach versus a consultant versus like a trainer versus a therapist. Um, yeah, all of that. Yep. Absolutely. And um, we are actually going to cover that topic. Does anybody else? Thank you, Seasons. Does anybody else want to jump in? Um, coaching versus teaching. Um, you know, I'm a parent, so I try to teach my kids or try to coach my kids so that they can reach conclusions for themselves as opposed to me telling them. Yep, absolutely. Anybody else have anything? Um, good ways to coach people that don't want to be coached. Mm, that's a great question, Paula. And, and the truth is, is you can't coach somebody that isn't open to it and doesn't want to be coached. Um, you have to be receptive to being coached. Um, so we're going to, we're going to dive into that, but that's, that's, a great question and a great observation. Does anybody else want to have, have any other input before we? Just one of the places that they compare things to. Um, my time in the service coaching compared to giving orders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just commanding people to go do things. Yeah, yeah. So um, you guys bring up some, some really great questions. So one thing that I'm going to start with is exactly what coaching is not. And we often hear, well, coaching is like consulting or coaching is like mentoring. It's really not. So what a coach does is it helps an individual envision a better future for themselves through challenging questions, thought-provoking questions, powerful questions. That is the goal of a coach, to help somebody envision a better future for themselves and make that a reality. Um, that is what a coach does. Question, since you said you don't mind being interrupted and interacted with, can you also coach groups? Does it have to be an individual? Absolutely coach groups. Mm -hmm. And as an agile coach, that is what I do. I co coach groups. Sometimes in one-on-ones, I end up coaching an individual on their skill in that role. And sometimes I coach a team on how to do better and why they're not talking in meetings and why they're not willing to share in a retrospective, right? So all of that is group coaching and group coaching is, is honestly super fun and engaging and people begin to feed off each other once that trust is there. Great question, Susan. So um, consulting, right? is defined by assuming that the consultant is the expert, right? Consulting is assuming that the cult consultant is the expert and they are there to solve, fix your problems and tell you how to do it. While coaching assumes that you are the expert and that you can get yourself there, right? Counseling, whether it be therapy, psych psychiatry, behavioral therapy, 
they assume that something is wrong and something needs to be fixed, right? Maybe you have a hurt in the past. Maybe you have a trust issue from the past. Something is holding you back from your future and we need to deep dive into that and fix it. Coaching assumes that you're whole and that you don't need any fixing. You need to be forward looking. Now, I believe Glenn mentioned, hey, um, tell me what to do, right? That's, that's training, right? Um, when you're training someone, you walk them step by step, you'll give them thought provoking questions. But in coaching, we assume that you are capable of going out there and doing your own knowledge surfing, right? And you could pull on other knowledge. And mentoring is providing some sort of sense of a guidance where coaching says you're going to be the guide. So are we a little bit thumbs up if we're a little more clear on what coaching is compared to the, those other differences? Okay, does anybody have any additional questions about what coaching is? So a lot of times people define coaching by what it is not. And that seems to be easier. And I'm not sure why, but there seems to be this thing what coaching is and coaching is not. So coaching is based on evidence, right? What is happening? Not what you perceive is happening, but, but facts. A lot of times we use the GROW model, which we're going to get into in a second. Coaching is supportive. It's a partnership. The ultimate goal of coaching is that one day you don't need to be coached anymore, whether it be individually or a group. You have gained all of those skills and that knowledge inside of yourself that you don't need a coach. We don't want to make you dependent, right? It's also founded in trust which is really interesting when we do agile coaching, because a lot of times I'll be sent in to work with a team that's not doing well, that has severe trust issues. And I'll go in and I'll talk to the team and I will make very clear to the leadership what coaching is. It's built on trust. It's built on all of these things. And I go in and I promise this, this team, these, this group, these individuals that I will not break confidentiality. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? And then, amazing, I have this meeting, I get a follow-up email from a manager. Hey, what happened in there? What's going on? Well, I can't tell you. I made it clear that I wouldn't tell you. In fact, I actually said I wouldn't tell you, but you were just saying that, right? Well, no, how am I going to get these folks to trust me if I, if I spill the beans, right? That, that, that's always a problem. And last but not least is coaching is a process. So as you are coached and you see what a session looks like or two sessions look like, and you begin to see and realize the patterns, you grow, the coach grows with you. So it's, it's a process and it's a way of exploring and giving opportunities for thought. And a lot of times in coaching, we hold something called um, silence. <laughs> and silence is, is really hard for individuals because they feel forced to say something. And if you hold a pause, People will begin to think and begin to speak and you allow them to reflect. So that's called um, holding silence. And that's an important technique. So coaching is not fixing people. Coaching is not providing opinions or judgments or guiding someone with your opinions and judgments. So for example, a friend calls you up and your friend was like, man, my boyfriend 
skipped out on my birthday dinner. He's not showing up um, for our dates. He's just coming over in the evening. I don't know what's going on with him. And you want to be like, hey, girl, stop it. He don't love you, right? But you can't. As a coach, you got to let that person come to it themselves, right? So I got some smiles. I always like to try to relay um, what coaching is to reality. Okay. So um, you stay neutral. You withhold your judgments. You ask the person to evaluate where they stand. You do a lot of reframing, right? If somebody says something, you say it back to them and let, let's confirm that that is what they've said. You may rephrase some, something to somebody so they can hear it the way that they said it. And sometimes they go, wait, what? I said that? Oh, no, right? And, and you get them to see by using their own words. So coaching um, is not a quick fix. It's just not. Something didn't break in a day. Something can't be solved in a day. It's not a one-time event. And it's not about tapping into an individual's weakness. It's about finding their strengths and what they're really good at. Who's got some questions? I see one of you all laughing at me. What did I say? <laughs> I have so many questions. I don't know where to begin. I love questions. So let's do it. What do you got for me? Well, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm just realizing that what I'm doing is not coaching. That's the <laughs> name I'm given. That's the name I've given. But that's not what I'm doing. So okay. what questions do you have? Oh, um, there are different techniques to coaching. Uh, I've heard of coactive coaching and I've heard of others. Which one, which one or ones do you recommend? Which ones have worked well for you? Yeah, so um, I think that a lot of coaches that I know naturally have an innate tuition for coaching. And I think at the root of coaching, while all of these models have come off, the original model was the grow model. And that, that model is interesting because it's, it's a very simple model. So the grow model talks about the goal, what is happening, what do they want the outcome to look like? And sometimes what they state isn't what they want and you dive into the question and you find that out. And then you take a look at the reality, right? What is the reality? What is actually happening? Let's probe, let's actively listen. And then options. What are the possibilities out there to solve this problem? And then G-R-O-W, the wrap up right? What are our next steps? What's our action plan? What's our timeline? When can we do it? So I think all of these models are fantastic, but I think they're all rooted in the GROW model. What other question? You said lots. That was plural because I was actively listening. I will let somebody else go and I will circle back to you uh, later on. Okay. Thank you. So hi, Michelle. Hi. Um, I think what I would kind of like to clarify, and I think it's one of the questions that, well, I think most people, when you get into agile coaching, you get to. So you know, from an agile coaching perspective, there is the X-Wing model. And mm -hmm. basically you are moving between teaching and mentoring, and you are also considered that you have an SME skill set. So from what I have found in terms of when I'm learning and doing everything coaching wise, I see that agile coaching, especially based on the company that you're hired for, <laughs> it is not really that you're sitting purely just in the coaching stance. And I've, I've never had that experience. I found that because I've worked in IT and telco, 
I've always kind of been in the starting to helping the teams in terms of facilitating and having that conversation. And then I might do a bit of mentoring, <laughs> which isn't completely, you know, just grow <laughs> model focused. So I think the bigger question for me is, does agile coaching really sit in the, should I say, the purest kind of stance of coaching, <laughs> where if you are, let's say, an ICF coach or a coactive coach, or if you're an ORSC coach, you're somewhat external to it. And I don't see agile coaches in, as being that really external to some of the things. <laughs> So let me kind of rephrase your, let me just make sure I understood your question. So I'm answering your, your exact question. Hey, looking at the X-Wing model, which for those that don't know what it is, I'm sharing the X-Wing model, right? Linda Atkins, uh, very, very famous. She writes coaching teams. I believe Chris Sims actually knows her because he knows everyone. Um, she created this um, X-Wing diagram and this is the foundation of the IC, IFC. So what the question was asked me is, hey, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, these are the coaching competencies. When I have seen companies hire agile coaches, the agile coaches aren't exactly in the coaching competencies. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, they don't sit in the coaching competency stance only. Do you get what I'm saying? Because you're doing teaching and you're doing mentoring. And then you're also considered as well to have some kind of SME skill like technical mastery or, you know. Sure. Um, so I, I hope I'm answering your question. If I'm not, let me know. So in this X-Wing diagram, it says a coach can and will act as all of these at certain times. When I'm in full coaching mode, I will say I'm gonna put on my coaching hat to let people know that I am not going to mentor them. I'm not going to teach them how to do it. They're going to have to explore it on their own. I don't really have much technical mastery, but this area says, hey, you need to be an expert in mainly one of these. My expertise comes from transformation mastery. I'm also pretty decent at business mastery, but I sit here for the most part. I do a disgusting amount of facilitation in my job, right? That's my job, to facilitate conversation, to keep the room moving, to keep anything going. And honestly, scrum masters, you are facilitators. That is your job. Your job isn't to be the technical expert. Your job isn't to be the development expert. Your job is to facilitate. Oh yeah, and you should also kind of be really good in here, right? But scrum masters are the start of a coach. They can develop into a coach. Some of them are actually natural coaches. So do I stay in one stance when I'm hired into a company? Oh gosh, no, never. I can't. One, I think that the coaching stance, um, the main essence of the coaching stance is to remain neutral and withhold judgment. And I really like to judge people. So I, I, can't, I can't hold that all day, right? I, I think it's really difficult. But what I can hold is, are you laughing at me, Season? I am because I was going to ask your advice on like, how do you hold that judgment back of the girl with her boyfriend? So we'll get to that later. Oh, I'm so not good at that. Ask my friends. I'm really opinionated, but I can hold the coaching stance and, and I certainly will when I'm in a room and it's for a finite time and I, and I do put on that coaching hat, but I'm here in transformation mastery. And a lot of that is teaching and facilitating and, and agile values. Does that answer your question? Maybe? I can't recall who asked the question. Christina, okay. It does, <laughs> thank you. 
Okay. Does it really, or are you just saying that? Twice no, no, no. I'm saying it does really because uh, because Avril mentioned that she thinks she, she thought she was doing the wrong things, and I was just like, no, I, it's not that you're ever doing the wrong thing when you have like a coach title. It's just that you're kind of sometimes going <laughs> through the different yeah, states. Yeah, yeah. You know, they they, and you know, a lot of companies sometimes they hire a coach because they. It, it's kind of like when a husband and wife or wife and wife or husband and husband or whatever are having marital problems and they go into therapy. They go into therapy mainly because they want the therapist to agree with them, right? They feel that the therapist is going to side with them and that the other person's going to be wrong, right? That's kind of the same situation a lot of times when a business hires a coach. They're pretty much hiring someone to go out there and like convince the people that they're wrong, right? Um, the the I'm sorry, did you say the world needs that? I think somebody just needs to be on mute. I was about to say, somebody's speaking, like, are we going to hear a fight? So, um, I'm sorry, could you go back and say what you were saying again, that when they hire a coach, when a company hires a coach? Sometimes a company hires a coach because they are starting on a transformation path. And sometimes I see a company hiring a coach because the company screwed up and they don't know how to get out of it. And they want someone to agree with them and like sue the masses, right? So I see right reasons and I see wrong reasons, but I think there's right reasons and wrong reasons for, for everything in life. So, um, you know, I, I always keep that cautious. So um, Chris forgot to mention that I'm brutally honest in, in the, uh, the intro. He'll probably do that next time. So, so I, I'm confused a little about coaching. I can get confused pretty easy. So we'll go with that. I like to think of coaching kind of from a sports pers perspective, because you're working on improving a team there, just as, as kind of analogy. But I see I, I see a coach as having to provide sometimes pretty specific feedback to people on how to improve their behavior in situations like that, where they're the technical kind of expert and they're saying you have to do this this way to to get in compliance with this or to improve that so you've got some things that way but then i also see times where that's not the best way to approach somebody and you might have to say to somebody else do you think you would do better if you you know swung a little sooner or swung a little later or did something a little bit different how do you get the balance between when's it time to tell somebody you need to do it this way or ask somebody and help them discover when to do it a particular direction because i think they both fall into into coaching skills as as a way of communicating a message to somebody with a goal uh glenn that is a a fantastic question and that is going to be the stance that you take right sometimes when we're just starting out and folks are new to an organization and they don't know the ropes you can't assume that they're going to know the ropes. Sometimes you just have to straight up tell them, right? Sometimes when you have new developers or scrum masters coming on board or a new proof of concept team is starting up and they need training on Agile, they don't know what it is. I can't coach them into figuring that out, right? Um, so the, the answer is, is I think as a coach, you have to gauge the situation. And once the folks are up and running a wee bit, it kind of turns into a little bit of mentoring, right? I'm gonna share experiences with you. So hopefully you don't repeat the same mistakes, right? So we go into that experience sharing mode. And then maybe we'll even go into, um, a situational mode, right? Maybe we'll give situations. And then it comes a time when you have to let the team act on their own. And you have to let go of your baby and hope that it walks. 
and you've got to let that baby fall and figure out how to get up again and mind your own business. And that that's hard, but that's how you know, right? And sometimes it's okay to let teams fail. Um, and sometimes it's not. And I think that when it's not, you have to gauge, does the team have confidence? Can the team come back from it? Um, and it's about the team and it's not about the management. And that's really a hard thing to do is separate yourself from the team and management. Because management's like, don't, don't let them fail. Don't, don't waste their time. But we need to learn how to fail, get over it. Can somebody catch the failure? How do we catch it next time? There's a lot of lessons um, to be learned. One sentence that I do see here is how do you have confidence as a coach? Would somebody like to give me more detail on that? I wrote that one. Um, and it's more of just like, I've interacted with you before this and I admire just your brutal honesty and the way that you carry yourself and the confidence that you have in speaking about coaching and things. So where does that come from? How do you develop that? Season, uh, season. why do I keep on calling you season? Um, That's season. fine. Thank you very much. Um, I can't really say that I'm, I'm confident. Sometimes I'm not sure of, of situations and I, and I have to go with my gut. Um, I'm, I'm an extroverted person. I'm out there. I'm not really afraid to say what's on my mind. I'm also from Brooklyn, so that helps, right? So I, I bring my, my New York self. Um, I have been told in jobs that I am intimidating, right? So now when somebody tells me that I'm intimidating, I'm just going to be like, no, I'm confident. So um, that's going to be my new line. So thank you, Susan. So just be from Brooklyn, basically. You got to be from Brooklyn. That's the only way to do it. That's right. I saw your snaps. I liked it, Avril. I liked it. Yeah. So I, when I, and that's the other thing, right? So when I, I do coaching, I do watch my audience to make sure that one, you know, are they feeling me? Am I feeling them? You know, are they nodding their heads? Are they, you know, not making eye contact? Did I confuse someone? So I definitely, um, body motion is, is always, um, very, very important. Avril, are you raising your hand? Yes. How has it been the difference between being in person and being over Zoom? Because for me, in person, I could tell so much more what's going on. I could read a room much easier than reading a Zoom. What, what have you, what is your experience of that? Yeah, great question. So, here's the deal. Do I think that it's easier to read a room? And do I also think that emotions in a room are contagious, right? They've done these effects that if people are laughing in a room, other people are going to be more happier, right? That, that's not the case online. Um, I think it's easier to gauge and read emotions in a room by far. I'm also one of those people that do not want to go back into the office. So, right? Like, I'm not even going to lie about that. So, um, I've, I've learned that it's really important to get to know someone. And it's really important to remember facts about people. So, I think Chris will tell you that prior to you all joining, I were remembered a disturbing amount of facts about Chris that he probably thought I was like a stalker or something, right? And see- Will you be like, sharing any of those? No. So he likes chai tea, so, um, or, or chai. So uh, that's what I'm sharing. So, and then season, like I, I, I spoke to her once, like for, for 45 minutes, like weeks ago. And I try to remember facts about people. And I think that as you form those relationships, 
that people are more willing to be open and be their authentic self. And I try to do my best to show up as my authentic self, right? Like I can't say I always do, but I try my best. So um, I think that's how I gauge a room. Christina, what you got? I was just, I wanted to say that it's, for me, I've actually found it really good being online. And I found that I'm able to be more vulnerable online and meeting people mm -hmm. <laughs> as opposed to being in the room. Because when I'm in a room, I can sense when everything feels kind of like heavy yeah. and that can kind of affect me. But because you have somewhat the barrier of kind of us being virtual and you focus on kind of like asking the right questions and people interacting, it has worked for me because I've made loads and tons of connections during the pandemic, but I know it's hard otherwise. Nice. You're sensitive to those vibes in a room and it interferes absolutely for sure. Great input. It's, it's funny. Sometimes I go the other way around. I've done presentations online to larger groups and I don't get any feedback. It's just got to get a set of headphones and you can't, everybody's muted. You don't hear anything. And it's like they fall asleep. Are they interested? Is this fun? Is it not fun? Is it, you know, what what's going on? And so I get a lot coming back that direction that comes up. So yeah. So I would say it's it's super important to have the cameras on in this virtual world, right? Mm -hmm. And I say that from a point of view of do I look like I want to do my makeup? Look, I had to shower again for the second time today at 8 p.m. So I was feeling all fresh for 10 o'clock at night, right? Like, I don't want to do that, but like we've got to. And then some days, I'm going to be honest, if I feel like we have a pretty decent relationship, I will scare you and show up without my makeup. You know? How, how do you encourage others? Because obviously it's their choice whether they turn on their cameras or not. How do you encourage that you just show up on camera regardless until people get comfortable what do you what do you do sure so i'm i'm a little mean right so i, I like chris's uh panda face so um i think that the the way to encourage people to show up on camera is one i have my camera on and i show up without makeup and um, I will also use people's names. And I find that the people that have the cameras on interact and ask the most questions. I also set up other environments um, to Glenn's point about um, questions. Is sometimes people don't wanna ask a question out loud. So I use this other tool that we're using right now so people could ask their questions privately or I say, email me or send me a private ping in Zoom or whatever. Um, I also do a lot of check-ins and voting to keep people engaged because if you're just talking at somebody, they're not going to be engaged. But if you're making them laugh and enjoy their time, they're going to be more engaged and more willing to come back. Another exercise that I'll do is I'll say, hey, everybody, um, put your favorite thing up as your background today. What is it? Is it a vacuum cleaner? Is it a car? I don't know, right? Let's, let's talk about it. So that kind of forces the camera on. And I also warn people, please put your camera on. Yeah, good question, good question. Does that help, Glenn? I think I called you Greg. I didn't you can, call you Greg. You can call me Greg, you can call me Glenn. I'm pretty, any G sounding word, I get ignored a lot. So any G, I'll just jump right on it. I'm actually the guy when they, when they started saying, what's up G? I was the guy they were talking about. I would never, ever do that. I would not ignore you. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? And then we're going to watch a, um, it's like an old video, but it is my favorite coaching video. Um, I'm going to kind of show the coaching video. I want to hear what you guys observed, and then I'm going to do a coaching session because I think I'm running out of time, aren't I, Chris? You are doing just fine. We're uh, fantastic. Yeah. You do you. You do you. I like it. Who has some questions for me? 
So you had mentioned before that you remember facts about people. You have tips or tricks on how to do that, especially if you have multiple people that you're in contact with? Um, no. Um, so I remember what I like about you really easily, right? Like, I remember, like, if you tell me something personal, I think I just have a really good memory for those things. I also remember what I don't like about you. You don't want to be known for that, right? But I, I think that I naturally, I don't ever remember anyone's name. God bless the people that put people's names here on Zoom, but I don't ever remember anybody's names, but like I'll recognize their, their faces. Sorry, that's not the answer you wanted, but. No, that, that actually helps me. I'm human. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. Um, okay, so then the other thing is helping people discover their own solutions. We're gonna watch a video on that and come back to, to that question. And then the other question is, what does an Agile coach do in a day? I write a lot of emails. Um, no, uh, what do I do in a day? Um, I spend most of my day facilitating, talking and checking in on things. I also spend a good portion of my day trying to envision what's going to happen next. Where, where is this gonna lead? I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, I try not to spend any portion of my day reporting or doing metrics because that's not helpful or useful. Um, I, I spend a lot of my day talking to people, um, usually with my makeup on. How do you, um, so I'm going to be on and off camera eating some Chipotle dinner. Oh, no, see, that's <laughs> actually a tip, Season. That's actually a tip. So I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> In my company, I'm, I'm looking for a new position in a different department mm -hmm. and so this guy is kind of watching me to see if I would be good and he's having me meet with his team I actually will eat on camera because it makes people feel more relaxed I mean you do you you don't need to eat your Taco Bell on on camera I mean I don't know if I eat Taco Bell on camera but like if I'm talking to Germany all in the morning, I'll, I'll be eating my cottage cheese. I know it's rude, but if we were in the office. Mm -hmm. We'd be eating. At the last meetup I went to, someone spent a good amount of time complaining about people who eat on camera. So now I'm just like, Meh, I'll, I'll leave myself to my Chipotle. And um, I've totally now forgotten my question. So it was something about what you said before we started talking. I thought the question is, is why, why, why don't we eat on camera? I don't remember. Yeah. Was no. it about the metrics? Yes. What do you do if you're asked for reporting and metrics? Who's, was that Paula? Who saved my life? Thank you, Paula. Ritual high five. Yeah. Reporting and metrics. We need them. Give them to us, Michelle. What do you do? Dewey season. So what is your definition of metrics? Is it customer satisfaction? Is it team satisfaction? Is it backlog health? Is it velocity being steady? What is your metrics? So if that's the type of metrics that you need, we could have a conversation about it. I do not need to put together a grand dashboard to make you feel special. So what kind of metrics? Are you trying to be my friend, Avril? I think you like me. Hold, hold on, hold on a second. Why would you as the coach be doing all these matrices? Shouldn't the scrum master be doing them or other members of the team doing them? You're just helping them put them together. What matrices are there really for a coach to put together about how well they're doing? It should be the team's matrices that management's looking at to make sure they're getting the results they want. Glenn, you are right on. However, leadership feels that they hired me. I need to be providing the metrics to make sure that they're getting their money's worth. And it doesn't have to be on team velocity. They just want some sort of metrics. Oh. And the metrics that I can provide them is how happy their end users are and their customers. 
I don't think Chris and Betty are inviting me back, guys. I'm giving you some bad advice. I, I was going to say, I think I'd have given a report that I talked to this many people. Yeah, yeah. There's a matrix. Yep, I hear you. Who else has some questions for me? Chris, are you going to invite me back? <laughs> of, course. of course. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Michelle, from a coaching Michelle. perspective, you might want to follow up and ask when. <laughs> when right? No, no, wait. Let me, let me let me get in front of this, Michelle. What do you think I should do? What do I think you should do? Oh, I think you do what's in your heart. Oh. And what do you think we'll get if I do that? <laughs> You might get an audience coming back, Chris. No, oh. <laughs> so I what, am gonna... what sort of goal could we create around that? Right, right. We'll take a survey. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you guys, and you're going to be like, please don't show me this cartoon that's seven years old, but I'm going to because it's a fantastic cartoon. Hold on, let me make sure this version is in English. Oh, no. Let me turn off my closed caption because the closed caption appeared in German for some odd reason. And I don't know. Speak as you do. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen, share sound, optimized for video clip. Is everyone seeing my video clip? Hold on. Yes. Okay, and if we can hear it, I need a little bit of a thumbs up. Hi, can you help me? Hey, how can I help you? I need to cross over. You want to cross over the stream? Hmm. What have you tried so far? I tried to swim. I saw a fish doing that once. You tried being a fish? <laughs> what else? I tried to jump high. I saw a bird flying over the stream. You tried being a bird? What else? I saw a beaver once building a dike and thought that might work. You tried being a beaver? Hmm. Would you mind getting into the stream? What can you see? I don't know. Water? And my reflection? Excellent. And what do you see in that reflection? Is that a fish? No, it isn't. Is it a bird? No. Is it a beaver? It's not a beaver. So what is it? It's a fox. So you are a fox trying to act like others. The others do easily what I want to do. So a fox can't do it. No! There must be a way. Can you see a solution here? Indeed I can. Then tell me. Be a fox, my friend. I am a fox. Then act like one. What would a fox do? I don't know. Foxes don't have a skill for crossing over streams. And what are your skills? Foxes are smart, observe and adapt. Oh, great. So, now, show me how you apply them. Wait, look! The stream is decreasing! So what? If I wait two hours... I made it! Oh, thank you! You are a fox. Well done, my friend. Okay, so what did you guys observe? I did stop sharing that, didn't I? Yep. Fantastic. So what did you guys observe? Questioning. What type of questions? Um,
asking like what, what you've tried, what you've done, like trying to dig in a little bit more. Probing questions, questions about discovery, open-ended questions, right? There was no yes, no questions. I heard summarizations, summarizing. Correct, correct. Summarized, maybe, maybe even doing some reframing. At the beginning, um, the owl asked, even though the fox said, you know, can you help me? The owl still asked permission to coach because you cannot coach someone that doesn't want to be coached. The owl held pause. He challenged him. What are your skills? At one point he said, so you can't do it, right? So he challenged him a little bit. So before we go into our um, session, we ask permission. That's always important. We find out what the goal is. What are some, some opportunities there, right? What, what's reality? And how are we gonna wrap it up? So those, that's the GROW model. And when we are in the stance of a coach, we are our authentic selves. We don't make believe that we're someone that we're not. We don't want to create somebody being dependent on us. We wanna transition knowledge to that person, right? Uh, we stay neutral. We, we don't ever let our opinion be known. And you let the person know that they're responsible for their own solution. So I will take a few more questions. What questions do you guys have? All out of questions. I do see one up on the Q&A side of that oh. polling site. It says, uh, how to establish yourself when you are newly joined Scrum Master and the team is full of experienced engineers, how to coach them to accept uh, what you want from them. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that that question is about getting in there. You don't have to assert power in any way, nor should you ever, even if you've been in the role. I think you let people get to know you, you get to know the team. I think it's really important to get in there and observe before you start giving in your opinions. I think people will respect you more when you know what's going on. And it's okay to watch and wait. And it's okay to say, hey, what's been done here before, you know? And then at some point, of course, begin to challenge. But I, I don't think it's ever a good idea to go in challenging. That's my opinion. Earlier, you had, earlier you had mentioned um, the you were answering the question about what you do in a day. And you had mentioned that um, you tend to kind of think about where this is going to lead. Can you expound on that a little bit and how you kind of think that through? Yeah. So it, it depends on the situation, you know. There's always a strong personality on a, on a team. Sometimes it's a new team. Sometimes it's an old team. Companies have the habit of saying, hey, you are a project manager, so now you're a scrum master, right? And, and they push people into these roles. And I spend a lot of time thinking about what's going to happen based on the roles that these people are in, based on the personalities that they're in. What can I do next? What brainstorming activity can I do? What type of conversations can we have that may ward something off that I see coming down, down the train? So, um, for example, I've just been asked to work with a team <clears throat> who does portfolio analysis. And 
I spoke to everyone individually. And it turns out that these folks don't even know what their end goal is. They don't know what they're working towards. How can they be a team if they don't know what their goal is? If they don't know what they're analyzing, right? So I spent a good bit of time thinking, okay, how can I bring this team together, not betray confidence, and help them achieve a goal, right? So we did uh, like a six hats activity, right? Where we were personas of other people, what would they want out of a portfolio? So a lot of time coming up with activities. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yes. Do you ever find that you end up having to coach the people that sent you out to coach a team because they might have the incorrect perception? And how do you go about coaching, not the team you got hired for, but the people that engaged you if they set you out for the on, on an incorrect task? All day, every day. Um, I, one, do my best to ask leadership to let me go in there and form my own opinion. That rarely happens, right? Opinions are like belly buttons. Everyone has one. Um, so I also do a lot of assessments. And I let them know my findings. And if they disagree with my findings, that's okay. But these are the facts behind my findings. Who's going to work tomorrow and sing belly button? <laughs> uh, Michelle, I was just laughing at that because um, it, you're it's so right in terms of how exec and leadership members are you know we're all judgmental but I remember starting in a row and literally everybody was bad mouthing one person on the team and I was just like oh my god red flag red flag like red flags everywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I was kind of just like okay let me just observe and see how long this goes on for but then at some point I had to go you know, it's not really healthy that everybody keeps saying that this one person is just like the worst ever. And it was, you know, like, how does it make that person feel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's rough. It's rough. Absolutely. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give everybody um, 30 seconds of silence. Think if you have something you want to be coached on. I'm going to just kind of time myself here. Everybody think deep in your brains and then we'll go from there. Okay, raise your hand if you have something. Season has something with that grin. I do, but I I don't want to go. Is it your boyfriend? No, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> if no one else really wants to step up, I can, but I'd like to offer this opportunity for anyone else. Okay, I saw a camera pop on. Stacy, do you have something? Was that your TikTok video, Stacy? <laughs> that was not me. Um, so I do have something that I could potentially throw out there, but I don't know if it's, hey, someone's got a hand up. We'll go with that. <laughs> um, okay, so Stacy, it, it could be an option as long as it's not fixing someone else. Avril, what you got? Okay, so I am working with uh, I'm working with a, a, a bunch of teams. I'm the only coach in a in a 
fair-sized um, organization and all I am seeing is what's wrong. How do I, how do I get over that? How do I, um, how do I stop being lonely? Because everybody else thinks that they know what Agile is, what, what Scrum is. And from listening to them, I know that they don't quite get it. So how do I get over all of that and just be a coach instead of being uh, judgmental? Okay, okay. Hold on a second. Season, what do you have? Sure. So mine's more personal. Um, so I've been working. Is he your boyfriend? With... It's not my boyfriend. <laughs> He's great. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's opportunities for improvement, but we are really open about them. And we also will do therapy sometimes, but not to see who's right or wrong. Just so, so we have. He's still new in love. It sounds like that, doesn't it? Uh, seven years. Is that new? <gasps> wow. That right? Was all right. All right. 33. 33 nice, years. Nice, Glenn. Um, yeah, so no, true. not the boyfriend, but something that I, I have been working with my therapist on is I place a lot of my identity and value in work, in my job, in my work. So if I'm successful in that, I'm successful in life. I think about it all the time. Like, what do you do? Oh, here's my job. And I want to get away from that. And I'm starting to do that. But now it's like, well, how do I get hobbies? Like, what do I do? What, who am I outside of work? So that's okay. mine. All right, Stacy, what's yours? Uh, I am, uh, I, I, I just finished the certified scrum master uh, course today. And Congratulations. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, yes, I said um, that earlier. Yes, I remember. <laughs> I am uh, trying to uh, transition my career yet again. This will be like the third time. Um, and I am trying to figure out basically which direction to go in. Um, like Scrum is really freaking awesome. I have a friend that's looking for a technical project manager. I don't necessarily know precisely what project management is. I just have everybody in the world. Well, not everybody in the world. I've had a metric boatload of my friends literally tell me, you would be a great project manager. You'd be a great scrum master. You'd be a great whatever. I don't know where I should go because I fear if I um, make the wrong choice again, <laughs> that my career is hosed. So. Okay. I'm going to help everyone. However, I am going to help. I'm going to coach Stacy because girl needs some help. Season, I am going to answer your question and it goes like this. I'm going to tell you a short story. I'm going to be a mentor for you right now, not a coach, because I can't withhold my opinions. Okay. I am not kidding. I work for a real estate company. Oh gosh, I'm old. 17 years ago, and there was this older woman, Dorothy. You'll remember Dorothy's name. <clears throat> Dorothy didn't really know how to use a keyboard. She loved her fax machine. She would put packages on a chair and wheel it to people's desks. One day, Dorothy dropped dead in the office. And she just fell out. Miss Beauty Pageant Queen came out of her room and said, does anyone no CPR. Does anyone know CPR? Right? In the building, the um, maintenance guy came running with the AED machine to use it on her. He cursed while he had to take off this old lady's wired bra. Somebody reported him to HR. And the EMS were, were very, very kind season. And they continued to make believe there could be life in her till they left the building because that was the courteous thing to do. We were all sent home and all came back to work the next day. Girl, they had painted that office. They had changed that carpet. They put in new cubicles. 
Dorothy's office, they broke down that wall and made it into a conference room in 24 hours. Season, your identity is not work. Now, Chris and Betty definitely aren't inviting me back. <laughs> I would say that was the best advice ever. <laughs> Who liked my advice? Yeah. Okay. And then Avril, I'm not going to leave you out. I'm going to answer your problem, your, your question. Thought provoking questions. How long have you been with this company? Three and a half months. Is the company worth it? It's the state. It's so a yes, what? it's the state. So yes. Oh, it's, it's the state. It's a government job. Okay. Okay. I'm feeling you. Okay. I'm a, con I'm a consultant. I'm not a, an employee. Okay. And um, I got the story, but I think I missed the <laughs> advice. The, the advice there, Michael, was not to um, wrap your whole life around work because your, your legacy and work will be gone in a day. And it's your friends and your families and your passion that that will continue to know you long after you're gone. Um, so they're asking you, Avril, to change the world? Um, uh, there are two camps. There's the camp change the world and then there's the camp the world is exactly how it should be. And your camp is what? My camp is that the world needs to change. So my question to you is, does it need to change how you want it to change and at the pace that you want it to change? Is, is a little bit of change, look at me, season, I'm doing so good, I thought of base. Is a little bit of change sufficient? Maybe walk away and have those aha moments and, and really add up to what that change is and see who you're recognizing it in and focus on that. And the only reason that I answered your question as opposed to um, bringing you to that is because I wanted to give you some guidance because you were willing to share your thoughts with me. I'm also, um, find me on LinkedIn. I'd happily have a coaching session with you since you were willing to share. Take me up on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Can, can I add something on that, Michelle? Absolutely. O o only because what was asked was that she asked how not to find bad things about the people and how not to be so negative. And I'm a huge fan of Zig Ziglar, who isn't around anymore. And he talks about being a good finder all the time and just spend a little bit of time focusing on trying to find good things about that, about people or about the situation might help you feel better about yourself when you when you go through that during the day. That would work for me. And one trick that I like to do is I like to get lollipops and then one at a time, maybe once a day, find somebody that did something really cool and just go make like kind of a, this is what you did today that was really special. And then just give them the lollipop because it makes them kind of happy. It makes you have to look for something to give people that for. And it gives me a good feeling because I like to see people that are happy. Glenn, in the good old days before COVID, that's what I did. I had little buttons that I used to, oh my, I, that's why I just love being a scrum master because there was so much it was a cheerleader and it, it was oh my god it was it was it was unbelievable so yes I used to do that but now with so but you know what you have a very good idea I can do it virtually I could find a way to do it virtually so you thank are, you does your company use slack no but we have teams and we were just talking today about getting um groups together and and using teams chat to just you know talk to each other there's a fun stuff. app there's just a fun app called hey taco that's for slack that's really cool okay but thank you very much that's a very mm -hmm. good suggestion i appreciate it mm -hmm. thank you i share thanks guys all right stacy may i coach you yes please okay i'm gonna ask everybody to put their mics on mute and turn off their cameras so me and Stacy can just focus on each other. Please don't interrupt. I am gonna do my best to time box this to 10 minutes. 
without guiding her. So cameras off, mics on mute. Stacy, you gave me permission to coach. In a quick summary, you said, so I really love Scrum, but my friend has a job opening and I've changed careers several times. And if I change it again, I'm hosed. Did I get that correct? Uh, there's mostly, there's several choices available to me and each of them is, appears to be a distinct path. For example, project management is distinctly different than Scrum Master. Um, Although earlier today, my friend with the technical project manager, they found out they don't have VC funding for the role, so he has to wait for it. <laughs> but in any event, um, there's lots of opportunities available in different directions to go. And I feel like I've changed my career several times, well, a few times, and I don't know which direction is the quote right one at this point. I look younger than I am, I'm 44. So if I keep doing this, I'm gonna have to start over at the bottom somewhere and I can't afford to go back to the bottom anymore. Girl, you're 44, what are you using? Is it oil of Olay? What kind of stuff are you, you, you have going on there? <laughs> Genetics. Genetics, well, I would like to meet your folks. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I understand the predicament that you're in. You feel like, hey, I've gotta get there. I've gotta choose. So. I think, are you telling me that the goal of this conversation is to have an idea of the direction that you want to go in? That would be wonderful. So what, what directions have you been in? I have two degrees in psychology. I did social work for 10 years immediately following that. Um, and I have done uh, technical training and tech support and about a random array of miniature programming things and web design and so forth but that was all in college and uh shortly after college and then um after grad school social work for about 10 years and burned out uh making this much <laughs> and so, so then i so went what to turned you away and i apologize and cutting you off normally i wouldn't do that in coaching session but i i want to try to time box it what what made you say hey I'm not gonna do these things anymore. Uh, social work, um, I, if it paid three times more than it does, I would make a career back, I would go back in an instant, but I was living like a broke college student and there, that's what my future was going to be. Um, what is it, it about it that you liked? I love making a difference in the lives of other people, solving their problems, um, literally saving lives. I was working in skilled nursing facilities. So I was literally assisting with saving lives of people, um, helping with grief counseling, all of those sorts of things, dealing with people in crisis and trauma, um, all of those so things. you like to help. Mm -hmm. You like to help. Money and finances is a motivation. And so where do you wanna go? So you're telling me that you wanna go somewhere that's financially secure. Yes. And you're telling me that you really enjoyed the aspect of helping and making a difference. Yes. Okay. So where do you want to go? If you can picture anywhere that you want, where is that? There's two things. If I, if money was no object, I would go back to school and get a master's of social work so I could work in hospice. Um, my current degree does not put me in the role that I would want to do, but I am paying a massive student debt about the size of a home loan um, to, for the degrees that I already have. Um, so I can't go back to school again. So I have ruled that one out as a result. Um, and you feel that you've looked at all options in that field? Which field? social work, hospice care, nurse care, anything that your degree calls for you feel would not pay a substantial amount for you to live on? Uh, my, my current degrees won't pay anything directly without a license, um, which I didn't wish to pursue. Um, 
but yeah, so what I, I would love to do social work in hospice, uh, but that requires literally a degree, a master's degree in social work, which I can't afford to go back to get. So um, I'm not able to do the role that I would be interested in. I could do like administrative stuff or something, but that does not interest me in any way. Um, there aren't other roles in hospice that I'm aware of that I have the education that supports, so. So um, what is inter of interest to you? Um, I like learning things and helping people and um, I am, very, uh, I like hosting events and all sorts of things. Uh, <laughs> oh gosh, Chris knows so much about me. He's known me probably like 20 something years. Um, but Chris has told me over and over again, he's like, you'd be such a great scrum master. You'd be such a great scrum master. You'd be such a great scrum master. And one of my best friends was like, you would be a great project manager. You'd be a great project manager. He kept like sending my resume to Google when he was working at Google. And of course, Google was like, wait, who's this person? Um, but, uh, I've heard so many people tell me that this would be a wonderful space that I have a lot of competencies and interest in. I am very interested in tech. Um, I like interacting with people uh, socially. I Most of my friends are in tech. Um, I feel like I blend well with people that are in tech, but I don't believe that I have the capacity to be like coding um, and get to a level that would be of the. Yeah. yeah. So for time's sake, I'm going to summarize what you're saying in a very upfront manner. Sure. You are telling me a lot of what people think you should do, but you're not an answering the question of what do you want to do? Something that allows me to be financially independent, uh, what I've been told, because when I was living in the Bay Area, I'm currently in Phoenix, in the Bay Area, I was told, marry rich. That's not what I want to do with my life. So I would like to financially be able to support myself through my death <laughs> and not hate going to work every day. So I know why you want to do it, but what is it that you want to do? That's a very good question. All so of the how things would you that go I about, enjoy don't pay well. <laughs> so how would you go about figuring out what you want to do? Uh, every aptitude test, um, you know, all of those, like, you know, what colors your parachute and, you know, like, um, all of those job aptitude sorts of tests. So I've been through ones that companies have paid for me to do. They all say you should be teachers, a social worker, a psychology, uh, somebody that's a helper person. Okay. So um, one option to help you figure out what you want is to take aptitude tests. Mm -hmm. What's another option? Doing things and seeing if I enjoy it. How's that going? I have enjoyed a lot of things. They do not pay very well at all, and I cannot live on my own. <laughs> and you feel that you've exhausted in those fields of things that you enjoy, that you've exhausted all of the options, and none of them will financially help you get there. As far as social work goes, I would say I believe so, but um, I quite enjoy tech as well. So, okay. I have so you enjoy tech. Not. Okay. Yeah, so I, what part of tech do you enjoy? You told me that you like planning. You told me you like helping people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm learning, like for example, going through the Scrum Master class today, I am learning the realms of, of, of what things are also possible that I, you know, people have told me, I think you'd be good at this. So I'm trying to explore those to see if in fact I would enjoy them. Um, when we were in the class, I really enjoyed doing the um, Scrum Master role and the project, uh, excuse me, product owner role. Um, I, you know, those were really, really fun, but of course it was just, you know, half of the days in exercise in the class. <laughs> so what's the next step that we could take to help you figure out where in tech you want to go? I'm not sure.
Can you ask that question one more time? What would be the next steps in helping you figure out where in tech you want to go? Next steps. Um, the next steps I had in mind was continuing to read all of the resources that like Chris has sent over and some of the books and a lot of the websites, you know, um, exploring some of the videos, uh, interacting with other people, doing some uh, networking, asking questions, what is the role actually like, those sorts of things. Um, and um, I was also going to look into, uh, there's also Google does like a project manager certification um, on like Coursera that somebody was pointing so, to me. So you're also interested interested in researching a different path. So when do you plan on having your scrum research completed by? I don't have a set date. I mean, I have a stable job now, so I have a lot of flexibility to take the time that I need. Um, I just Let's set a date. Oh, set a date. Um, where are we? We're in June. I am moving in July. Probably take me a month or something to unpack. Um, middle of September. Okay. So September 15th or so. Your plan is to have researched the scrum role sufficiently, whether it be talking, networking, or whatever, to see if you need to move on from the scrum role. Okay. So after the September 15th date, you're going to say, yes, I want scrum, or no, I don't, right? Yeah. And if you don't want Scrum, what's your next steps? Um, I think simultaneously, I was also going to look into project management to see, because I know they're related, but very, very different. And I'm still wrapping my brain around how are they related? How are they different? Why would you one one goal at a time? So then your next goal would be to focus on project management and make a decision there. Sure. So we kind of have a little bit of a plan? Yeah. Okay. All right. Everybody turn your cameras back on. So I kind of had to push her through a little bit, right? Because we're on a time frame and I've just eaten the crap out of Chris and Betty's time. So um You're doing great. Don't worry. Do you? So um anyway, so I hope you guys see that I asked permission. I tried to answer a lot, of, ask a lot of probing questions, tried to get her to see what she was saying. And when she was kind of skirting away from nailing down um, an action item, I pushed her back to the action item. We nailed down some dates. And then when she started complicating it, I tried to uncomplicate it, right? So um, of course, a very time box coaching session. All right, Chris and Betty. So unless anybody has any questions for me, I'll turn it over to you guys. Oh my goodness, my goodness. Well, thank you so, so much. And uh, I'm really thrilled for, for this evening and all the stuff you've shared. And uh, also thanks Stacy. oh my goodness, for, for stepping up and being the volunteer. Um, that is super duper fantastic. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording now.